Hey, welcome to the show. You're listening to Business in Vancouver, the daily business news program from Business in Vancouver newspaper and BIV.com. I'm Tyler Horton. And I'm Haley Wooden. Our next guest has argued on the show previously that the future of work is really the now of work. When you look at technological innovations, as well as the emergence of the sharing economy and the connected generation, they're all already leaving their mark on the world of work. We're going to dive into the forces driving these changes with Rocky Ozaki. He's the co-founder of Now Innovation and the vice president of community at the BC Tech Association. Thanks for joining us again. Thanks for having me again. So are we fully aware of what we're in for, how disruptive some of these forces are going to be to business models and the way we work. Yeah, I think certainly some of the more uh, forward-thinking organizations are living it today, but on mass, I would suggest that most companies are still trying to figure this out. Well, what are some examples of things that are driving these changes, though? So I propose there's three main forces, Tyler. One is the connected generation, as Haley referenced. The other is technology, and the third is sharing economy. So if I could start with the first. I hear from CEOs and C-suites all the time about their stress around the millennial. How are we engaging and attracting the millennial? So I'm going to start there before I tell you what the connected generation is. With the millennial, um, as much as I dispel this notion of generations being that different, I think that's what we generalize too much, here's what I think are different with the millennials. The first is, is that they are parented differently. And so I'm not going to go psychologist on you today, but I would hypothesize that when a generation is brought up generally to say, you know, participation medals just for being in an event. When it comes to, I tell the story a lot, when I grew up, that the dinner was, hey Rocky, you're having chicken. Okay. Well, this generation's asked, do you want chicken or steak? And they say, I want sushi. And what do they get? They get sushi. And so the parenting around being more collaborative, having a say on decisions from vacations to your dinner, how does that not translate to the workplace? Particularly as we navigate toward this idea that work-life balance is dead and it's just life. So there's parenting. But I, I'm sure this creates a little bit of friction in the workplace as well if you have the managers that are not necessarily part of the same generation, right? That's right. And so that leads to you know another point that's of, of the five I have around millennials is one is that the balance of power is changing. And so this is true, what you're saying. But now I, when, so I go back to storytelling. When I was, my first job, I remember putting on a suit and a tie, and I remember going into the interview and, and begging basically to get a job, and I would leave with the hiring manager, HR department, saying it's in their, their control whether I get a job. Well, now we look at the workplace and who's in control today. With the digital economy and the skills that we need in the workplace today, they're owned by the younger people. And so now they go into jobs right away with having this notion of, I'm important and you need me. And so there's a psychological play there. Uh, I'll tell you a story though. I mean, when I first got into the workforce, I'd go do the job interviews. I remember it was actually for Business in Vancouver, the newspaper, the previous editor in chief. This is the first time I ever asked this question. I was ever asked this question. How many Twitter followers do you have? Yeah. And it's not, it's not a question I was ever used to answering before in a job interview. Yeah. So it's interesting to see, you know, people are emphasizing those skills. Even older generations are recognizing that those skills, those attributes are needed now. That's right. And so to, to finish, the, the other point is that now look at the numbers. So all these things I hypothesize, but what doesn't lie, in my opinion, are the facts. The facts are that in North America, by 2020, 50% of the workforce will be millennials. The facts are by 2025, that number could be upwards of 7%. So when I talk about the connected generation, I talk about this centennials or the Gen Zs and the Gen Xers, younger generations like myself, when you put all three of those generations together, now you're looking at potentially 70% of the workforce by 2020 and 85% of the workforce by 2025. Why does that matter in the context of your story? Because the, this generation now has the power, is the biggest cohort in the work, ever to enter the workplace. And so things like Twitter followers matter. They're changing the way we purchase, they're changing the way we market to them, they're changing the way the workforce is because they own the workplace now. It's not the baby boomers or older that now drive these decisions in, in, in the marketplace. To what extent are employers going to have to bend over backwards to accommodate millennials? Because I can see that going, you know, so far until maybe CEOs from different generations, let's assume, say, you know what, we can actually find talent somewhere else. Yeah, Haley wants to make sure she knows exactly how far, you know, <laughs> they, can she can push, push the boss. Yeah. Yeah. So this is probably one of the most powerful things that we see when an organization actually embraces this. You do not need to fear the millennials. You do not have to necessarily bend over backwards for the millennial. You just have to first understand them. Again, I'm gonna take away millennials, it's a connected generation. Do you understand where the world is going? 
Can you appreciate exponential change? Yes, and so are you fighting all these other things? In our personal lives, we adopt technology as if it was nothing else. Why are we not adapting in the workplace as well? And so if you generally are gonna fight technology, I can see you fighting it in the workplace. But if you can embrace technology and exponential change and believe these things are happening, why can't you take that same mindset to the workplace? So the great organizations that I see embrace that thinking. And so it's not fitting over backwards, it's seeking to understand is seeking to create an environment where we all belong and say, okay, how do we all work together for the greater good? And this is why also we believe at Now Innovations that you have to have frameworks and methodologies that back up that thinking. And so you don't feel like you're compromising business results because it still is about business results in my opinion. Yeah, we should have said this earlier, but uh, give us kind of the pitch if you're at a dinner table. What is Now Innovations all about? So Now Innovations, number one, is we want to create a, well, is it number one? Maybe there's one A, one B, but we want to create a conversation that democratizes this whole, the whole conversation around the now of work. So first of all, we call it now because the future work is talked about a lot, but the reality is it's here today. So now of work, now innovations. So what we want to do is to create a following of people who can share their best practices at no cost to the broader community around the world so we can all have this conversation. But inevitably what that leads to is that that's great, you've given me a teaser, can you help us actually transform our business? And that's where we come in. So we speak about the topic, we bring people together, and then of course when the time comes, we will actually engage with consultative work to help them navigate through this future work or now of work. We're speaking with Rocky Ozaki, he's the co-founder of Now Innovation, and he's also the vice president of community at the BC Tech Association. So do you think businesses who will be successful once we fully merge into the future of work or the now of work, whatever you want to call it, are those who have more of the flexible mindset? Because it, it can be tough to predict what the future holds by way of tech. Mm -hmm. So the two words I use is creating organizations with culture of innovation and agility. And so, yes, the world is changing fast, but you can actually put in frameworks and thinking and leadership who embrace that innovation and agility that's happening. So agility to me means is that you're not stuck. You know how you hear the joke about it, um, annual performance reviews are dead? It's because in the past, we could predict a year out where our business was going to be and what success looked like. And in more innovative and forward-thinking organizations, we're saying, well, we actually don't know what a year even could look like because of technology. And so let's bring that down to quarterly goals. And even in some organizations, down to like bi-weekly sprints, like if you're in the tech space, for example. So I think the companies that win embrace technology. If number one, it are very agile, and number two, embrace innovation. And so I believe that you should be spending 70% of your time in any organization innovating your current product or service. You should be thinking about 20% of looking into you know, somewhere more adjacent to your business, and about 10% of something completely different. And if you have that mindset, then you create a culture where you're always thinking about improving and always thinking about what's next. That's what's gonna help organizations win. So Rocky, how do you know you're going down the right path though? Because there's constant innovations. How do you know that you're gonna pick the right one as opposed to all the other options that are out there? You mentioned that 10%, you know, the, the things that are completely out there. I don't know where that fits into this particular puzzle though. So, I don't know if organizations do know. It's but if you have the mindset and you have the people and you have the culture and the framework to be agile, you can pivot then. And so maybe you are going down the wrong hole, but a part of your business if you don't put all your eggs in one basket and you can pivot quickly, then you give yourself better future proofing. So no, I don't think anyone can predict, whether you're Facebook or Google or Uber or anyone, what's gonna happen in the next three years. But create a culture where you can adapt, create a culture where you embrace the change, you're not stuck on a business model, then you can survive for longer than your, your competition, in my opinion. And when it comes to the types of innovation we're looking at, are we looking at, or should businesses be looking at what's currently sort of on the cutting edge? Should they look at what's more established, say e-commerce? Should they be coming up with their own ideas? So, I don't know, oh, wow, that's an awesome question. I don't, I haven't really been able to tease that answer out in my own head. What I can suggest is there's always going to be leaders because of, for any, no other reason they have the cash to do that, to be innovating and create new technologies, etc. And there's always going to be early adopters and laggards, etc. So, I think what's more important is that you just, again, embrace it, that Innovation is happening. Do you always have to be the leader? No. But when something happens, can you easily pick up and follow that, you know, catch that wave? I think that's just as important as being the leader because not everyone can be a leader. But how do you get everybody on board? You know, we have this generation that may be more flexible, you know, the millennials, centennials, uh, even younger than that. But what about maybe some of the other people that don't want to move, move with where the flow seems to be going? 
So we found that the, it's very clear it's the baby boomers that have the biggest challenge with change. And so my advice is to stick to the, the old disciplines of, of change management. You know, if the, until they know the sense of urgency around the changes you're making in the workplace, until you give them a vision, until you have a guiding coalition in your team that's sort of helping them along the way, you're not going to get them on board. You know, why would they? Change is hard for anybody. But we're talking about seismic change for this generation where hierarchy was important to them and all these other security and pensions and, and lifestyle are so different than they are today. Bring it back to a people level. Embrace the, like I said, the model change management. Help them understand why this is good for them and the business. Do you also think that, you know, I, I don't want to pick on this generation versus that generation, but do you think the, the generation of the more experienced people, it's sometimes undervalued? I, I think experience is something that, look, you can't just, like, get it overnight. It's not going to come with innovation. It's going to come through, like, 20, 30 years on the job. 100%, yes. It is, is so the air... Arrogance is a strong word, but you see this in, in, in more than one example. It's a generation, but it's also this whole startup versus corporate battle that's happening. Startups think corporate are dead and are slow. Corporates think startups are irresponsible. The truth is there's going to be a middle point in which they can learn from each other. Likewise, the millennial can learn so much. And they're actually saying this, by the way. They're saying is that what, what the millennials want or the connected gener generation want is to know how they contribute to your vision. They want to know how you're developing, developing them personally and professionally. And they want mentorship. They want to learn from the other older generation, the experienced ones, as long as they can respect that they're different and they can find a middle ground. But 100%, there is it. We cannot win in this world without the experience and wisdom of the generations that have done it, that live. There's something about wisdom that you can't teach. Yeah, most businesses aren't suited to just pursue innovation for the sake of innovation, right? It needs to be tied or, tied or anchored to something yeah. that may come from, you know, tried and true experience. You know, another thing I was thinking as talking through is take a Facebook with a lot of the millennials, the reason why they're so, you know, fixated with becoming a CEO or c suite so quickly in their careers is because they have an example like a Mark Zuckerberg who in the early 20s you know, became a billionaire, is changing the world, why can't I do that? Well, my generation never had those examples, and so that's one thing. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the fundamental differences that the generations are, that generation has an advantage that other generations didn't have before. I feel like we just barely scratched the surface on this topic, but it's been a fascinating discussion. There's really lots to think about. Rocky, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. That's Rocky Ozaki. He's the co-founder of Now Innovation and the vice president of community at the BC Tech Association. You're listening to Business in Vancouver on Roundhouse Radio 98.3. I'm Haley Wooden. And I'm Tyler Orton.